She takes my hand and moves it up towards her breast. She slides my hand down between her legs. Pull my hand back up and say, slow down. It's okay. She turns back to me, lying down on her side as we're in that spoon position. <sighs> A gasp in which that true love could be conveyed between the both of you so that when you were naked, when you were breast to breast, when you're heart to heart, peering into each other's eyes, that a full expression, a full fire between you two could be transferred. Right, what could be more necessary between two human beings? How to unlock a woman's sensuality, breaking down those walls of fear, judgment, expectation, so that you could join in an eternal dance of masculine and feminine energy in which that she would feel totally accepted within your vessel. So that that sexual pleasure that could transcend from the physical to something a little bit more spiritual, something in which a deletion of self could be practiced between you and her. People that have been hardened, people that have locked away that purity, for fear of destruction. Maybe they've been abused physiologically, psychologically, sexually in their time. And you come across women like this that have an ice turtle shell-like nature. It feels impossible as a masculine being. You want to treat her right. You want to do the best that you can for her. But she just puts up the walls. Well, instead of, climbing, instead of trying to climb the walls first, maybe we should have a conversation with the God. Maybe we should create a relationship with the God. Teach the God that you cause no harm, bring no harm. You're only here to understand, and that is the point of this podcast. And one of the main features of today's lessons will be that we endeavor to access a woman's sexuality and the purity of which that is, not so that we can manipulate it or take advantage of it, but so much more to be able to understand who she is and how her experiences in life have informed who she is, shaped who she is. And in doing so, you will learn about yourself. And with all that being said, this podcast is brought to you by BoldDojo.com, where you can book one-on-one -on -one coaching with myself in order to create action plans, overcome limiting beliefs, destroy negative self-perceptions, and egoic attachments. Have a listening ear to the trials of your life, helping you to move forward. You can also sign up for the free weekly email newsletter, The Bold Sip. It's just a quick sip of social dynamics and anything I'm exploring on Fridays. Just go to BoldDojo.com, sign that up. You can also hit up the free resources of wisdom where I drop my favorite books, movies, quotes, anime, documentaries, music, all of that, all at BoldDojo.com. And if you would like to help support this podcast, you can donate anything that you wish through the PayPal link, paypal.me forward slash A-D-A-M-O-O-I. Link is down below in the description, or you can also donate directly through the website, also linked down in the description. Anything that you guys do donate is always extremely appreciated and just goes back to helping support the show and what I do here. So thank you very much. And if you do get anything from this piece of content, please let me know in a comment down below. I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible and also please drop a thumbs up on the video it just helps the youtube algorithm helps send out the video to more people in the community and if you find that you resonated share it with a friend you think would resonate as well let's get into today's show so the context for today's session is that i was working with a new client last week who is of a strong christian faith and does not wish to relinquish his virginity until meeting his soulmate and along with that, he's working in an Arctic environment. I won't mention too much more than that, early 20s. And he had posed a very interesting question, which was how to bring out a woman's sensuality, amongst many other deep philosophical questions to do with the nature of developing one's masculine energy in this life. But specifically on women's sensuality, how to bring that out. He had retold of a experience at a strip club. I don't believe it was in the Arctic. I believe it was back in his home country, the U.S., of a seeing for the first time a woman expressing that sensuality in his words. Now, in this podcast, we're going to define the difference between sensuality and sexuality, just because I believe that my taxonomy is slightly different to the actual etymology of things. So if you look at the literal definition of sensuality, it is the pursuit of the five different pleasures, particularly when it comes to physical sexual experience. However, when I think of the word sensuality, I think of that as something a little bit more pure, a little bit more spiritual, and I attach a little more spirituality to it. An idea of the concept of self coming in with not only that pursuit of the five pleasures. So when I talk about sensuality versus sexuality, sexuality very much in the raw nature of the very raw physical expression of sexual desire, which is actually probably more aligned with the literal definition of sensuality. But when I'm saying but just so that you can understand my words in this session. Yes, yeah, sexuality, raw physical expression of sexual desire, sensuality, that plus an understanding of self and maybe transcendence of self, if we can get you there. So he'd been telling me about the overwhelming nature of watching a woman express her sexual desire, her sexual feminine energy, and how incredible it was, how amazing it was. And he posed the question to me, how could I bring that out in a woman? And I threw back to him, well, first off, who would you have to be? 
who would you have to be as a masculine being to allow a woman to access that level of freedom, sexual freedom, psychological freedom, most importantly, because as we, or as you should know, the psychological must be unlocked first before the physiological can be delivered. And a woman will not let go, even in the most micro and raw tactics of a full body orgasm. A woman will not achieve full body orgasm if you have not set up a space in which that she can psychologically set herself free, in which that she can free herself of the judgment, the expectation of maybe the pain of the past, and now diving into the pain of the past. So much more important it is for you to inform yourself of what that pain was. And so, as I said to my client, part one, you want to unlock a woman's sexuality, you want to bring that out, show her that you are holding nothing, you hold nothing that the judgments and expectations do not exist, whether you have slept with 20, 30, 50 guys, whether you have been abused, sexually raped, whether you have formed a complex around masculine energy in which that maybe is quite destructive, maybe unfair, maybe overly harsh, maybe overly critical. That's okay. I'm not here to change your views. I'm not here to change your perception of masculine energy. I'm just here to show you what I can do, what I can provide, show you my principles, show you my way. You know, as the legendary 16th century samurai Miyamoto Masashi had his heiho, his way of being. As a masculine being, listen to this, you must develop your own. You must develop a place within yourself in which that you could convey to a woman, these are my principles, this is who I am. And both ways, I don't need to change you, you don't need to change me. Let's just experience each other in tandem. My apologies, my friends. I just had to take a quick moment to let someone out. And getting back to the guidance to my client on accessing that sensuality of a woman. First off, she needs to know that she's free of judgment and expectation. And I said to him, who do you need to be? He goes, well, I need to be confident. I need to be bold. I need to be courageous. I need to be strong. Those are all true. But first and foremost, you need to be able to sit down with the guard and teach the guard who you are, the way of who you are, as Miyamoto Masashi had once defined for himself. So, Make sure that you have those principles under belt, that when you're approaching a woman, and now let's get a little bit more micro, a little more tactical here, out of the analogies into the raw examples. Right? You say you're on your first day or on a second day with a woman, and you're finding that you're really connecting. You're finding that maybe after a great walk on the beach or out of dinner, or you guys have been in the botanics together, and you just find a quiet moment, of course, in isolation, in which that you could be down on the rug together, you could be down on the sand together, underneath the moon and stars, and that you could just pose a very simple question which is, tell me about what you've been through. Simply, what have you been through? For my younger listeners, for those that are maybe in their teens to late teens, you may not have frequented a type of human being which has been through a Rolodex cacophony of traumatic experiences. But for those that are starting to progress a little bit more in life and maybe in your early 20s to mid, particularly as you start to get to late 20s, and more so as you're engaging people who are in their late 20s, what you'll find is that that simple question of, tell me about what you've been through, that question right there will yield quite a treasure chest. If you are taking it back to analogy here, if you are going to sit down and you are posed with a, a giant a giant cell in which that there is a battle-tested, hardened guard standing out the front, and you say to the guard, tell me about what you've been through. First off, that may incur a little bit of a shock. The woman may be a little bit shocked to know, to even understand, uh, compute why a masculine being would want to know what she has been through. Now, if you've been, this is all predicated, of course, on you being direct, congruent, authentic, covering of empathy throughout the entire interaction, from the way that you met, to the way that you were on the first date. And so that now, this is all leading to this moment where you are on a couch with a candle, like I said, under the moon and stars. And you ask her, tell me about what you've been through. Said with the right tonality. Said with the right sensuality within your voice. That does incorporate a little spirituality. To know that this is not simply, oh, tell me what your life journey has been in general. You know, when you're in a raw, intimate space with a woman and you say, tell me about what you've been through. Especially if you sense that a woman has been through something. Maybe you've been getting the inkling. Maybe she has already shown signs of being relatively locked off in regards to the expression of her sexual energy. Maybe she doesn't hug particularly well. Maybe she doesn't, maybe if you attempted to kiss before, her kiss was less than free. 
If there is any restriction in freedom of her sexual energy, right, these are all signs, these are all clues to a woman that has locked away that ac- access, locked away access to the purity of her sensuality. So a simple question of tell me what you've been through. I'd like to know if there have been some things in your life that have been troubling, difficult. Help me to understand. Small words, simple words. Right? You don't need to express an entire podcast podcast worth of philosophy towards a woman. Just a simple nudge. She'll get the picture. And with that question, and with that conveyance of intent to understand who they are, you may shut up. You may fall quiet, but not fall asleep. It actually requires far more energy to listen well than to talk well. I analogize this to running forward versus running backwards. Running forward is talking and expressing yourself, something that we're all very, most of us are quite naturally conditioned for and feels a lot easier. We spend most of our lives doing so. But running backwards is very, very difficult. Running backwards is analogous to listening. It's very difficult to listen properly, to not listen so as to form your own response, but to listen so as to just purely understand the experiences, the viewpoints that this person is shaped by and is now. So as this starts to unfold, you will find out very quickly the answers to these questions of when was her sensuality locked away? You know, you can prod with questions or you can offer, I should say, questions if she seems to be stalling if she seems to be at a loss for certain words, if even uh, if it didn't go down the direct route of intimacy before, intimate partners before, you know, you can even just simply ask is, you know, tell me about what your experiences with masculine beings have been if it needs to get more directed. Right? But oftentimes what I've found in my experiences is that that opening question of tell me about what you've been through or if you've been through, have there been troubling experiences, that often if you're speaking to a woman, often centers around, if there are already, towards masculine energy in general. Speaking on a personal example here, I just met a new woman last week. I think it was the beginning of last week. And it was very interesting because she had actually reached out to me on Instagram and she lives in a different state. And, you know, I'm always open to conversating and expressing with people, particularly with my Instagram audience, who have come from a certain viewpoint of being against authoritarianism, totalitarianism, and uh, looking to join a community and be around like-minded viewpoints of people that are still in- interested in individual freedom and are still interested in living life free of tyranny. But even more so, when I find examples of particularly uh, females that come across and, you know, they might send a cheeky message here or there uh, showing a little bit of interest. And sure enough, this woman had uh, a particular say in response to one of my stories saying, I haven't even had one jab. Would you consider going out on a date with me with a uh, tongue, tongue sticking out, wink face emoji? And I said, you know, let's skip the date. Skip, skip the date right now. We may as well just move to Hawaii and get married. <laughs> All right, you you, uh, you tell your parents, I'll go choose a dog. And so from there, we found a, a bit of a spark and I said, well, let's get on a phone call. She lives in a different state. So we got to talking on a phone call, I think it was about a week and a half ago, and two hours gone by. Two hours gone by and we had expressed the deepest of ourselves, really, as much as anyone really could in an initial two-hour phone call of an absolute stranger. I don't recall the exact position in question. I don't believe it was tell me about what you've been through. But actually, no, I can actually recall for it. I can recall. It was actually very early on in our phone conversation. And what I found actually was that she was a very strong woman. Very strong. Very beautiful. Ostensibly, appearingly, seemingly very beautiful. But in her energy, very unexpected. The way that she had texted me and that we had a few little back and forths through the DMs, she had appeared very soft and sweet, very um, very playful very soft sweet playful but when i got to speaking for her on the phone i realized she was actually very fiery very assertive very hardened if you will not in a negative way not in a way that was i mean i was going to say the word restricted but i need to take that back hardened in the sense that you can tell this woman does not take shit 
that she would not put up with boyhood psychology, that she would only engage with those who are of a certain standard of behavior and psychology, of a manhood psychology. I like this. I like this. Very fiery in her energy. Within the first, I would say, half an hour of our discussion, I inev- inevitably fell upon the question of, and it wasn't. It initially started with a statement, ended with a question. The statement was this: that you know, I'm getting this energy from you, and um, let's give her a fake name. I call her fake name Jenna. Jenna, I'm getting this feeling from you that you have very strong, you have very fiery energy, which intrigues me as to your vulnerability. I want to know about your soft side. Do you find it difficult? to access that vulnerability, that soft side. Without hesitation, she unloaded all of her experiences to do with interaction of masculine energy, her loves in the past, how she doesn't feel that she had been the same woman since her last love, that even, of course, she had dated since her previous love she had been with for five to six years or so, from I think late teens to early 20s. But then since then, she's roughly the same age as me, getting towards her late 20s, a couple of years younger than me though. And for the last three or four years, she's been with and dated other guys. However, she self-professed and admitted that she has not been the same woman with them as she has been with her previous love, that she has not accessed the same level of love and if we can now, sensuality and in the words of the conversation, vulnerability, softness that she did with her previous partner. For the reasons, we would be here all day. But the point of me bringing this up was that simply by me asking, by me asking, and I just want to, I keep saying me asking, there was a statement there at the beginning and the statement is quite important. The statement is quite important when you come across a woman that you feel is restrictive. Now you may, now let's take it one step back. When I was there in the moment, what was I detecting? What I was detecting was that when I am presented with a woman that has shown me some form of interest, direct interest with this woman, like we're on this phone call because we know this is this is something of a phone call date, if you will. Not that I would ever refer to it as that literally, but you know, it's a there is an establishment of direct interest between the two of us. So it is incumbent upon me as a masculine being to be extremely direct to say exactly what I'm thinking and feeling, but to do so in a congruent, authentic manner that covers with empathy. So a statement to begin with that is very bold and very direct, which is, and actually as I had, uh, when I had posed other examples to you earlier in this conversation of, well, tell me about what you've been through in life or tell me what struggles you've experienced or you know, tell me what you've been through. That's the most important part of it, but feel free. Feel free as you start to step into your masculine energy to convey statements that offer a step off this path, off the direct path, sorry, off the beaten path, I should say, onto an offshoot. And that statement being of which that, this is how I feel about you. As a masculine being, to directly tell a woman how you feel about her, rare, very rare. As you'll find later on, as I start to work through this story with this woman a little bit more, she conveyed this directly to me. I'm skipping forward a little bit, but she conveyed to me a few nights later after reflecting on this, and actually, I do need to pause that, otherwise we're skipping way too many steps, but I'll say this in general, that every time that I've ever told a woman directly, after deep levels of listening, just listening to her story in life, listening to what she's been through, her experiences, etc., that she would come back to me then saying that, you know, most guys have never done this before. Most guys have never actually genuinely, integrally wanted to hear everything that I've been through and to not, most importantly, label that afterwards or to offer some form of remedy to fix that afterwards. The broken wing mentality, the broken bird mentality. So coming back to this now. To start with a statement, hey, Jenna, this is, I feel, not that I used her name directly there, but now that I'm reorienting your minds in this podcast, speaking to Jenna, I feel like you're this uh, very fiery. You're this fire burden. You're very strong. Uh, you, you don't take shit. And I love that you don't bend, bend your personality to other people. But yeah, tell me about that vulnerability. Tell me about the soft side. Do you have trouble accessing that? Because this is just a pattern that, as I have forayed into human experience across life, is very, very common amongst feminine beings that have been mistreated 
that have been abused, particularly sexually. Prisoner and the guard. Prisoner being the purity of their sensuality, the guard being that battle-tested, hardened warrior at the front that will not allow any such further destruction to enter. And that's all we're doing right here. It's just having a conversation with the guard. We don't, and really importantly as well, is that in this first conversation with Jenna, or if you're listening to this podcast, in the first conversation with a woman that you sit down with, whether you're on the couch or on the stand, that you're not attempting to achieve anything. The objective mentality, and I'm saying the pursuit of an objective to gain an end result, is a hardwired masculine trait. It is what makes men very, very... uh, competent, very competent and very effective in getting shit done and being engineering types. But not in this space. You need to relinquish that in this space. And particularly when it comes to human dynamics, a lot of what makes men great in other areas when it comes to highly emotionally intelligent requiring conversations are very detrimental. So as a masculine being here, there's another takeaway. Let go of having to achieve. If you want to unlock a woman's sensuality, let go of having to achieve the result then and there. Let go of having to force force a understanding from the guard to be able to unlock the cell door to allow access to that purity. No, we're just here to have a conversation with the with the guard. The mentality should be that you are willing to come back day after day, night after night, season after season, to just sit down on a couch, sit down on a pillow, bring a couple of pillows, bring a good cup of tea, and have a conversation with this guard. And that if the guard coming back was to present adamancy of never allowing access to that sensuality. That should be okay. That should be more than okay. And it is with that being okay that you would only ever install the comfort and trust within the guard to allow access to the, her purity. So as I'm in this conversation with Jenna, hours, literally hours go by that really stemmed off my pursuit of wanting to understand her vulnerability and soft side and how she hasn't been able to access or really give access to that in many years, in at least three to four years or so. I think this is beautiful. The conversation rolled on and as I was alluding to before, a few nights later, we were exchanging voice messages and I had said to her, it was actually just last Friday night, I exchanged a voice message with her in which that I said that the way that I feel about our energy, the balance between our energy is that you are the wildfire upon which dances my solid rock. I feel that I can step into my rockness a lot with you because of how wild your fire is. She responded by saying that she likes how I use my words. She really likes that a lot. Articulation of language can be very attractive. More so, though, that I believe to be articulate and to be lingually competent, it's more so the energy that sits underneath it, right? the energy that inspired your conglomeration and your sequencing of words. So not so important is how extravagant your vocabulary could be, but how extravagant your energy is, how well-developed your energy is so that you could sequence words to be able to convey meaning of what is within your heart towards someone else. That is what a woman is speaking to when she says, I really like how you use your words. Not, not that I would encourage you now to go and study the Merriam's Dictionary or get a thesaurus out. Get a thesaurus out while you're uh, constructing sentences. No, but construct your soul, most importantly. Construct your spirit, most importantly. So moving beyond that, with that exchange of... With that exchange of voice messages, me telling her, again, notice another direct statement of how I feel about our energy together. Why this is so important that I don't think I hammered on enough before is because when it comes to unlocking someone's sensuality and developing that comfort and trust, you need to step forward. The guard will not come to you. The guard will not unlock the cell of that purity just by walking out into the world and looking. She will not look. If the very nature of there being a prisoner is that the guard needs to be there at all times. So you will not find that, do not hope as a masculine being, that just by spending more time with her, dancing around the fact that she seems restricted, locked off, that is unable to access her feminine vulnerability and that softness. 
that sensuality. Do not think for a second that she will come to you asking you for help with that. Or that she would come to you asking you to understand that. It is a proactive measure. And that really is the only proactive measure you must take in this scenario. In which that you state how you feel. You provide feedback. You provide the expression. And I've I've detailed this a lot recently. Many, many times recently. So many stories. So many examples of in just the last 10 podcasts or so of me saying there was this woman. And she was presenting this type of behavior. And this is what I said to her. Uh, there's that woman on the beach who, uh, who is very capable of expressing and talking, but when we hugged, she could barely hug at all. Her hug was like a 10% hug, and so I had to tell her, by the way, I noticed that you do you, have, do you have problems with hugging? Is there something about hugging? Because I noticed that you really are very weak in the hug. I can barely feel your hug. And she goes, what? I mean, weak in the hug? And this wasn't a story I was actually telling Jenna which is that there was this woman that I had to convey to her on the beach in which that, yeah, like I, I feel almost nothing from your hug. Like it feels like a leaf. It feels like a leaf hugging me. And she was shocked. She was amazed at this because she was like, I thought I was, I thought it was like normal. I thought that was a normal hug. And I said, yeah, but I think it just maps to how you are emotionally restricted in general. That's how it feels. And she goes, what? Shocked even more. And she goes, what? I thought I was really good with my emotions. And then that woman went away over a couple nights, two, three nights, and she came back to me a little bit after saying that she had a deep crying session within the shower at realizing how much she had locked away her emotionality and how she locked away that part of herself that could give, give a free willing hug of full strength. Powerful. Really intense. I told that story to, in more depth, I'm just shortening it here. I told that story in more depth to Jenna on the phone. She went away with that. A few nights later, where I'm in, sitting in the garage, opening up a voice message, uh, discussing this, it was off the back of me discussing how her energy relates to mine, her fire dancing upon my rock. And she said to me that, you know, Adam, I don't just talk about my past relationships and all of these extremely sensitive and vulnerable things to do with love and my ideas around love and my ideas around relationships with anyone. Um, This is not stuff that I'm discussing every day. And, you know, it's really only with my absolute closest of best friends. So for me to do that with an absolute stranger, someone that I never met before and that we're on the phone by all measures, by all things, she goes, you just, I was, I was reflecting on that and how you just made me feel so comfortable. You made me feel like there was no there was no screening mechanism happening here. This is my words putting into measure, trying to recall her words. There was no screening going on here. There was no judgments and expectations going on here. It's just, yeah, it just felt so comfortable. Nothing makes me smile any more than that. Because of course, I, being a coach of social dynamics, am aware of what happens when You can sit deeply into the present moment with someone and you can absorb all of them. And the confident trust that will lead from that. It's not a surprise that someone would unload the pain of their life when you're sitting into the deep presence with them. When you can convey a purity of spirit in which that love is truly communicated. The transference of an understanding, a mutual understanding that while I operate and exist within an ego known as Adam and you exist within your ego known as Jenna, the aim, the end goal here is to delete both of those concepts and to join each other in full presence of now. This is the end game, if we could step out here for a moment, I know we're getting off on tangents, but if we could step out for a moment, the end game of all this unlocking of sensuality is not so that you could have a better sexual experience. While that is a byproduct, that is not the product, that is not the primary impetus, our inception of intent, our inception of intent when coming into a raw, intimate space with someone, whether it be just on a phone call or whether it be body to body, naked limb to naked limb, and you're feeling the heat and the sweat of the skin involved in each other, wrapped in each other, you feel that your eyes are literally in each other. When you look into someone's eyes and no, no longer is there a separation of distance, but when you look into someone's eyes, you have fallen into them. To fall into someone's eyes requires a deletion of self. 
And so that that would bring about, of course, an immense, overwhelming sexual experience between you two. But not so that. Not so that. That is only the byproduct. The product being that we could access the height of human potential. The height of a human experience, which is to forsake and forego the egoic concept of who I am. And to step in to who we've always been. No one. So as to be everyone. That concept, to delete oneself so as to become no one, so that you could then become everyone. Right? That's the full, that's the full tundra, if you will. That's the full, that's the full circle of life. That you go from this elevation of Yes, I form who I am and you're very self-focused and you understand that, okay, um, my name's Adam and I live in this house and I drive this car and I work this job and I need this and I need that and you're very, very self-focused and you're not really providing much service to anyone else in the world. But then you elevate to a next level as you start to develop your spirit to recognize that actually there are other people out here and there are other people out here that are of the same nature as me. And if surely by me benefiting them, that benefits me, but more so because I want them to enjoy the best experience possible. And as you start to pursue a life in which that you're trying to get the best outcome for both people then you find this closeness this this drawing of which that to a closer concept that if we are so undifferent so similar that we all desire love peace and joy then surely my egoic concept is but a concept itself surely it is not based in reality Surely there is a much deeper reality to who we are. And then you come across this understanding that, oh, that must infer that I am no one then. If my concept of self is so fleeting, there was a time before, there will be a time after it. So fleeting is Adam. And then, and then as you start to play through that, maybe you take you a few years to play through that and to, to walk through life realizing that, okay, Adam is not as important as Adam thinks he is. Adam is not as eternal as he thinks he is in terms of his egoic concept. But then maybe you happen across one more further realization, the completion of that circle, which is to realize if someone else could experience that same realization of no oneness, then we must all be the same. We must all have come from one, from one source of inception in this life. Bringing you together. So through this elapsation of I am me to I am no one to I am everyone. And then at the end of all of it, you'd come to silence. You'd come to breathe. Because at the end of all this realization, what does it all amount to? Well, if it didn't amount to you being able to sit there in front of a woman who has been through tremendous pain and destruction in her life and to convey to her true love, not love that comes with a Disney narrative, not love that comes with stipulations of who we will be after this or who we were before this, but love that steps into the presence of who you are now. Love that is imbued with the full power of the depths of a fire between you and her within the spirit that exists within your heart, finding home within your heart. You put those two things together. You put, you put those, all of those things together. And now you're experiencing what it means to truly be human. Humanity is a transcendence. The experience of being human is a transcendence. There are levels to this game, as the kids would say. There are levels to our experience. Psychedelics can help you there. Psychedelics can certainly help you there. Would I encourage the use of psychedelics to help unlock someone's sensuality? I'm sure there are examples in which that someone's sensuality is so locked away, the prisoner so hardened, that maybe you can't even talk to the prisoner. Maybe the prisoner isn't even able, sorry, the guard is not even able to talk to himself, herself, in this example. Then maybe the next level of psychedelic aid may be a profit. However, so far in my life, this is what I'll say, regaling my experiences, in which that I have not come across a woman yet, in which that, she also, and this is key, she also pursued a curiosity, intentful desire to want to set the guard free. I have not come across a woman that had that intent, that I was not able 
to join that expression, to be able to join that adventure, to be able to sit down on that little pillow day after day, night after night, season after season, to help talk with that guard to allow the prisoner free. And what I'm saying there is that there's not a woman I've come across yet that has been so hardened or so intricately confused, intricately confused as to how or why she would want to set her sensuality free, who also wanted to do the same. You see what I'm saying there? It's a different scenario if you've got a woman that you know that, because, and it's just a default, all women desire the ability to be free, sexually, sensually. But not all women desire to set that sensuality free. Depending on their process of healing, depending on the stage in which that they are in terms of perceiving, conceptualizing of what is transpired within their lives. They may not have a percent of interest. They may have only just hired the guard, if you know what I'm saying. They may have only just locked the door on it when you came into their life. This I, I need to be very fair in demonstrating this, which is why it's so crucial to be free of outcome as a masculine being because you're going to come across women in all different stages of the healing process. You know, women that have just started to lock that prisoner up, lock their purity up, it's very unlikely that you're going to reverse that process, especially if it's come from an inception point of pain. If you've just come across a woman who's literally just been raped, who's literally just been broken into a house and a man raped during the night, if you just come across that woman, it's very unlikely that she's going to want to now, in escape of two, three, four, five, six, six weeks with you, gain and give access back to the sensuality that she has locked away for fear of destruction. So key to understand. And but how, my friends, how it seems like it can it can seem very overwhelming as a masculine being. So many, so many contingencies, so many potentialities of how this can manifest. Well, not real. Don't get overwhelmed. Don't overwhelm your mind in all of this. Because there's principles. There's principles that we stay by. And if you are seeing yourself in this giant mountainous landscape in which that carved out of the mountain is this cell. There's these giant iron bars that sit within the rock. And behind it is her female feminine sensuality and the love with which that she knows so pure. And out the front is that guard, battle-tested, hardened warrior. The only principle that, well, the most important principle that you need to understand is that I just show up. That I just show up as purely as I can to listen, to understand, and then to also reflect back, which is where you find the statement of how the guard is presenting herself. How it manifests. Right, to ask questions, to pose questions, to pose statements followed by questions that have no intent but to elucidate more from her. Not to fix her, but just to elucidate and illuminate more from her. That's really, and I've, I know I've had to, I think that was a really nice packaging of it, but I think it's most important as we dive into so many different examples, so many different stories, to just center you all on that. That is the role. That is the job. Uh, with Jenna, on the phone, that was all I was doing with her. With the woman on the beach, when I was hugging, that's all I was doing with her. I was never, I never once did I say to that woman who really struggled to hug, never once did I say to her, you need to get better at hugging. I'm just saying this is what your hug is like. And so you go and do what you will with that information. I'll go, I'll leave, you go away. She goes and has a crying session in the shower, realizes some deep emotionality, comes back a few days later, gives me a 50% hug when it was previous, previously only 10%. I tell her that. I'm saying that's a lot better of a hug. Still not there yet. Like in terms of like it's still pretty weak, but you're doing a lot better. And graduation, a gradual process you will find. Man. Man. Speaking more now to getting sexual, that's where I'd like to take this podcast. Let me take you into a future projection. I'll, we'll do both. I'll take you through real examples, but I think it's actually quite powerful for you to now understand where my mind goes with a uh, fake name, Jenna, who we have this, we found quite an intense connection with each other just through phone. Now, that's pretty powerful, especially when it's mutually reciprocated for absolute strangers. 
to be able to open up about their lives. She'd said to me that, you know, I feel like it's going to be really, I think it's going to be electric when we finally meet each other in person. I said to her, it sometimes feels like this may be with the Titanic situation in which that we develop this amazing, awesome connection, but eventually we never meet and one of us dies or one of us moves to Mexico and starts selling drugs. <laughs> uh, jokes, of course. Talking about the fragile nature of which is what we have right now. You know, it can be stuffed out in a moment, can be destroyed in a moment. You never know. So live for the moment. But she asked me if I felt the same about whether I felt it would be electric when we would meet each other in person. I said to her, I've been trying not to visualize that. I've been trying not to allow myself to daydream about what it would be like when we finally get together because I would never be able to complete anything in my day if I did so. For another most important reason, that for our purposes in this podcast, not that I said it to her, but something that is monumental for us to understand here is that I don't daydream and I don't try to envision how I will overcome what she is confidently told me is an inability to access the true depths of her sensuality over the last four or five years. I don't try and visualize about that. I don't try and daydream about that. I wait to get into person with that. I wait to get into body to body with that. And that's why a lot of this session has been very flowy. It has been very, you, you feel, you've probably felt me in this session access different levels of cognitive awareness and perception in which that we try and get into that if you were to light up a candle right now as there is one behind me and if you were to just stare into the depths of a fire something i would encourage you all to do is to if if not now if you don't have the capability to do it now later on tonight get a candle get a candle light it up in a dark room and just stare into the flame stare into the fire the fire meditation in which that you lose yourself in a trance watching the fire dance watching it rotate around its center point, watching it flicker back and forward. You find it going like in high vibrations and then slow, long, drawn out movements. This is what I analogize to trying to understand a human being and learn someone in the moment. And when it comes to someone who's got a barred off sensuality, they lock that prisoner away. The most I would ever want to achieve in that moment is to enter a trance of fire with the guard to inspire a space with the God that I, I, just, I, just need, I just need to be here in front of you. That's it. That's all I need. If I can be here in front of you, that's it. Now, the questions would become, the questions would become, oh, actually, wait, we're not there yet. That'll be the next part as to when, how, how much is too much or when, when, when is this a lost cause? We'll get to that in a second. But just we're realizing we're, yeah, there's, this is a very emotional podcast, so we can get off on tangents, but I'm bringing it back. If I was to get in person with her, which I foresee is likely, before clothes come off, before the sheets, before the sheets get peeled back, the sheets of your heart must be peeled back first. All right, if there is a cloak if there is a veil covering that which you can emotionally express, that needs to come off first. Principles I have outlaid in this long-running podcast series of which that I need to get to someone's heart first. And I know that can sound a little potentially adversary or manipulative if you aren't clued into this session, like if you just took that as a soundbite. But when I'm saying I need to get to someone's heart, it's not get to it so I can take it or so that I can abuse it, or so I can manipulate it. You need to get to someone's heart so that you can see its nature. You can see what it's about. And many a time, it works out It works out for you that when you really do get to see someone's heart, I need to retrace one step. It's whether they allowed you to see their heart or not. That is of crucial importance. Because that in and of itself would tell you to answer the question I was going to pose before of when is this a lost cause or when do you realize? And a lost cause, it's a nice it's a nice way of just packaging a concept that I know all of you will relate to. 
But really, I don't believe anyone is a lost cause. In truth, I believe that everyone has potential to change, to evolve, to dive deeper into who they are and evolve beyond. But realizing when someone is at a certain impasse, and yes, as human beings, we only have so much energy within our days. We only have so much time within our days. And there is definitely a time and a place in which that you have to make those decisions, but we're not there yet. So taking the sheet off someone's heart, if someone can take the sheet off their heart first, right? that's what, that, that development of trust between you and them, that is what is what actually give rise to the most powerful of sexual expression itself. I mentioned before full body orgasms. All human beings possess the potential to access a full body orgasm, specifically speaking on females now, to squirt, Right, to go into full contractions, to just turn into, uh, what's the word? You know, demonic almost came came into mind then. Demonic without an evil nature to it. Demonic in the sense of, and I know because that's me just bending the word completely, but what I'm trying to say there is possessed, trance-like, trance, trance is probably a better word then, trance-like in a way, just like I said, diving into the fire. When you just, when someone has entered a full body orgasm, they are within a fire of who their true nature is, what their true nature is. To access that, you must deeply trust not only the person in front of you, but who you are and who you two operate within an environment and space together. That trust could only be established first by you being that that traveler, that wanderer, who can sit down on a pillow with the guard and convey what your true intent would be. And so when that is established, and I would always want that to be established first, before sexuality. Now, this brings us to an interesting point. What about women that have actually, hmm, this is a good one, actually. This is a pretty good one. What about women who are overly sensual, to which the point of it locks their sensuality? Ah, that sounds like a, that sounds like a contradiction, though, Adam. Please explain. So, Women that can, so we've been largely discussing ice turtle shells for most of this podcast. Now we're starting to move into the firebirds. So those who react to traumatic experiences in life that form a complex of unworthiness so as to pursue that further. So which that, let's say for example, common examples of mistreated by father figures in their early stages in which that this is all they know and this is their concept of installed worth i am worthy of being beaten verbally abused sexually abused and so i will now pursue that in perpetuity going on throughout life because that is my concept of self that is my where my identity has been formed women that have come across uh male partners sexual partners that it was all take take there was never even give give so and as if to be used almost as a receptacle a receptacle of sexual extraction you know, that is all she is seen as being worth worthy of. Never any emotional care, just purely to have sex with and done with her after that is what I'm displaying there. Have enough experiences about this, have a certain psychological makeup, and you would approach that now looking at and certain women approach that, looking at it going, well, that's what I'm worth and that's what I'll seek moving forward. So this is actually almost a little bit more intricate than a nice turtle show. A nice turtle show is actually a lot less complicated to understand it's very it's very easy to diagnose to analyze to understand being presented with at first glance but being presented with a firebird is actually it's going to require a lot more social savviness to understand what's happening there because of what happens in the raw sexual nature of things when you do actually start to remove clothes that and actually it may not have even have popped up this is what's quite quite interesting quite key is that when you start to sense overt sexuality, yeah. When you start to sense that a girl is kissing you too fast, touching you too much, you know, you're on your first day together, you just sat down on the bench and she's already rubbing the inside of you, like, hang on a second, hang on a second. I barely even shook your hand. What's happening here? Now, for a masculine being listening to that, you may think, oh, that's what I want. You think that's what you want. You think you want a woman because that is what. That is what a lot of mainstream media, whether it be Hollywood itself, whether it be social media, Instagram, pushes is that this overt sexuality between human beings, particularly pornography. If you're a masculine being that has been 
raised on pornography and that you've grown up with such a toxic influence, especially imbalanced with real human sexual experience, you would think that you want, because that's what all porn displays, in which that is this heightened... uh, these heightened narratives in which that it goes from the plumber walks in uh, to fix the tap and all of a sudden she's sucking his dick. Uh, there's there's an incredible elimination of actual human dynamics and principles that would lead up to that. Because I'm not saying that that wouldn't, scenario wouldn't happen at some stage, but it certainly wouldn't happen like that. Bringing this back. Overt sexuality should send a masculine being when you receive that from a feminine being a alarm bell as to what would be happening to cause this. Why would she do this? There have been many, many... Okay, let me try and give you a... Pers- before I get a little too hot on myself here. Let me let me ground that. I was about to say many, many, many examples. But you need like that relative. What is many? So I would say it's probably 70 to 30% split. If that's me being pretty generous, actually. Being conservative? No, no, no. That's me being conservative. 70 or 30. In terms of my experiences with women across my 29 years, almost, I would say when we're talking about women that have come through some form of psychological abuse that stemmed into physical and sexual as well, 70% fall towards the camp of ice turtle shells. 30% fall towards firebirds, lusting firebirds, as I refer to it as, in which that they start to seek poor treatment, start to seek poor behavior as opposed to ice turtle shells pushing away from even good behavior, pushing away from all masculine energy. All right. The lusting firebird is a inducement, a addiction to poor behavior because it, largely they don't perceive it to be poor behavior. They say it to be sustaining towards their identity. So that's why I was just giving you relative terms. So I've come across a decent amount of feminine beings who have fallen into the lusting firebird nature. And they one of the key alarm bells is that they are always overtly sexual, too fast, too hot in the pace relative to our connection and establishment of comfort and trust. So what's so confusing about this as a masculine being is that you would look at that and you would look, well, you look at it on the surface and go, oh, she's really in connection, really in touch with her sensuality and her sexuality. Maybe if we're using our terms here, sexuality with the spirituality of things, but at least with just the sexuality of things, she seems very, very sexual off the bat. Hang on a second. There is definitely a midway. There is definitely a way in which that a woman can be free. Well, I I, I need to pass that out. What I was going to say there is that, of course, there is a woman that is well harmonized and well balanced within herself with her sexual energy and has a great concept of her understanding of self and does not have a prisoner in the form of her sensuality, but has two warriors standing out the front of a mountain. And there has to be a very large demonstration of why those two warriors would, and warriors is a, uh, let's talk about spiritual warriors rather than battle warriors. I don't want to put that idea in your mind. More of spiritual warriors at that point in which that those women expect high, high performance. They expect high deliverance of masculine principles, direct, congruent, authentic, covering of empathy, before they would even entertain joining a relationship in connection with that, with that masculine being. So they're not weak, which is why I'm using spiritual warrior there. They're not weak, but, and so then they're not also so gullible or so, weak was really the best word there. They're not so trained on weakness to expect that any masculine being approaching them would do them well, even if what they're ostensibly presenting is not good. You know, when I'm talking about guys that are actually going to treat them very poorly and do treat them very poorly, yet they still continue to perceive that as being good for them. Women that present overly sexual, you have to be very aware of this. You have to be very key on this to slow them down. Very difficult as a masculine being to actually just say to a woman, hey, actually, you are... I like where you're going with this. I like, I like, I think where our minds are in the same space, but I'm just not quite there in the pace with you. You know, I, I like that, particularly like I remember many clients have had that have come back to me on sessions and tell me that, you know, Adam was on a date with this woman last night. It all seemed to be going very well. I went back to her place and, you know, she seemed like very, very kissy in the car and that was okay. I was all right with that. But, 
you know, it's almost like we walked in the front door and she always all of a sudden wanted to start taking clothes off. And I know this is very counterintuitive or very counterpresentative to what the concept of masculine beings would be, which is that why would this cause a problem for a masculine being? It would cause a tremendous problem. It would cause a, cause a tremendous problem for me, which is that a relationship is a two-way street of comfort and trust. A relationship, it's, it's not just that, you know, that's the problem with porn is that it makes you believe that there is no requirement of trust on the masculine's part. No, 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 no. Unless you are intoxicated or unless you are of a certain psychological complex in which that you are maybe borderline on sociopathy, when you're maybe a borderline sociopath, you need some establishment of trust, not just on, hey, is this person going to kill me? Is this person uh, going to take my shit or, you know, knock me out and the housemates are going to rack my shit? You know, beyond the survival-based stuff, I'm talking about, would this person actually take care of my body? Would this person take care of my spirit? after taking care of my body, or vice versa? Would they even want to understand my spirit first, then in order to be able to understand my body? That's a key. That's a key. And even key for a masculine being that is starting to understand who he is in true nature. As a teenager, if I can hear this conversation back, listening as a 16-year-old Adam, listening to 20, almost 29-year-old Adam, this is probably flying in out, in and out of one ear straight over the cap. Probably not making a lot of sense because it's just so underdeveloped, inexperienced. But what I would say to 16-year-old Adam is that that's okay if all of your experiences with women are with women that are well-balanced in their energy, have not been mistreated at all. And so that's what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about my, how would my 16-year-old Adam perceived this, he would go, is this really all necessary, Adam? Is it really necessary for me to have a spiritual understanding of trust between her and I in order for us to access the true levels of sexuality? (laughs) Is that necessary? I couldn't imagine anything more necessary. What could be more necessary than a trust between two spirits in which that true love could be conveyed between the both of you so that when you were naked, when you were breast to breast, when you're heart to heart, peering into each other's eyes, that a full expression, a full fire between you two could be transferred. What could be more necessary between two human beings? That to know that after that fire had fully expressed itself, that there would be care on the back end, that there would be a willingness and a desire to hold that woman close to you, to feel her heart, to feel her head raising up and down on your heart, to feel an intertwining of threads, of karmic threads, of spiritual threads within this life. Not so that you could fall in love and create a monogamous exclusive relationship together, right? That's stuff that may well happen, may well happen. Maybe you want it to happen. Maybe you don't want it to happen. It's not necessary. It's not necessary in that moment. What's necessary in that moment is that there's a recognition of human spirituality, that there's a recognition of humanity. So 16-year-old Adam, listen to this. What's What's most necessary? Pure sexual animalistic expression, pure the pure animal of things, right? The PPMs, the pumps per minute. You can make sex. You can make sex. You can make hard sex. But if there is no love intertwined with that sex, then you always feel a sense of lack. You always fence, feel fulfill feel a sense of unfulfillment. It is deeply unfulfilling to go through a sexual experience in which that it was only about the pumps. And it was only about the positions, and it was only about what was physically experienced between you two. Now, that's okay. That's okay as a younger, underdeveloped being who has not come across other beings who have been abused and mistreated to not grab, hold the gravity and gratify the importance of establishing trust between you two. Now, I was largely beginning this point on masculine beings who need to feel trust themselves coming across overtly, overly sexual women. I remember this. I remember the first time I ever felt this. The first time I ever felt this was when a woman, and she was not a woman psychologically, a girl psychologically, female, but she was in her early 20s and I was in my mid 20s when we had been lying down on the floor together back at her place. And I think we'd had dinner that night. Yes, we had a dinner that night and I was lying back down on the floor at her place and you know, we were in the spoon position 
and I was very happy just breathing with her. I was actually teaching her how to breathe properly because I noticed her breathing rate was a little too fast, just a little too fast. I noticed that her movements a little too restricted. I noticed that her sexual and sensual freedom a little too caught up. Why is there so many thoughts going on in her mind? You know, you, know you are really tapped into a moment when you can hear someone else's thoughts. Through the practice and cultivation of a meditation in your life, whether it be a walking meditation, a swimming meditation, a sit-down meditation, a lying meditation, a moment, a deep moment in which that you would persist through presence, where you would learn to cultivate a cessation of thought. This is largely how one would develop the ability to be able to be there in a moment, in a sexual moment with a woman, and to understand what she's thinking. Just recently, don't worry, we'll continue the story in a second, but just recently, I've had several women tell me, it feels like when you look at me, Adam, that you're looking into my soul. It feels like that when we connect eyes, you are drilling to the very depths of me. And it scares the shit out of me. (laughs) One woman in particular said that to me. Like it scares me how much you can see me. Another woman recently, this is all within the last few months or so. But just last week, a woman said to me, I know that when you're looking at me, you're not really just like looking at me. It's like you're looking into me. I say, yeah, it's part of my life philosophy. To see without looking. When you look at someone so deeply in the eyes that you've stopped looking and that you just see them now. That's the height. That's the that is the absolute standard of excellence when it comes to eye contact. Because the eyes at that point are purely a tool. They are purely a mechanism through which spirit can be conveyed and understanding of spirit. But to have cultivated that type of eye contact, most necessary, coming back here, back to the story. If you are so well practiced to the point in which that you could be in a physical moment with someone reading their energy to be able to hear their thoughts, they're not saying it, but you can hear it, and you can hear that they're pressing themselves, you can hear that they're trying to do too much, and so I'm lying there in a spoon position on the floor with her, and I was very happy just trying to get her breathing to calm down. That's a really good indicator of a girl that's rushing herself. Why is her breathing rate so out of sync with mine when it's just a nice, seemingly casual night? It's a lovely night. It's a calm night. The crickets are cricketing outside. The moon is mooning outside. There is no policeman at the door. There is no hordes at my gates. There is no pressure here is what I'm trying to allude to. So why would her heart rate be so out of sync when my heart rate is so relaxed? This, on a very physiological level, especially when you're talking about a podcast of unlocking sensuality, you want to look at physical indicators for when someone has locked off their sensuality. And again, this is what is so paradoxical, that it exists both ways. That you can have a woman that's a nice turtle shell that will not even let you get close, wouldn't even get into the spoon position with you like that because of her fears of destruction, sexually, sensually. Would never allow access to that. But then you've also got someone who goes the opposite end who is also locked off the purity of their sensuality and have now replaced it with a moniker of sexuality. This is really key. Just because a woman is being very sexual with you does not mean she's being very sensual with you. Say that one more time. Just because a woman is being very sexual with you does not mean she's being very sensual to add with the spirituality of self, the purity, the divinity of who they know themselves to be and what they would like to experience in a true flame of human human expression, humanity between you two. That is not the same thing and it can be very confusing. So how one would indicate that is that, well, if a woman was truly in touch with her sensuality, in the full vulnerability of things, really able to be fully vulnerable, and is not accessing or vehicleizing through a protection mechanism of that, I will just be very sexual with him, just go through the physical act, right? The, the, the friction, right? The friction, the rubbing and the friction, so that I could cover my need to be vulnerable. Are you understanding that? Are you feeling that? If you can feel that, then certain indicators would come up. 
there would be a rush to it. There'd be a rush mentality. There would be a misstep in pace. She would have to be unpresent, non-present, so as to be so within her mind to be missing the cues so that her synchronicity of heart rate and breathing would be off. I'm noticing this with his girl. Now, it's it's harder, it, it's step by step, of course, but it's harder to tell in the early stages. It's not until she makes a very adamant move towards sexuality that was really off pace that you really start to understand this. So as we're lying there in the spoon position, you know, I'm attracted to her, of course. I'm hard in the pants. I've got an erection, of course. I'm spoon to spoon of a girl I'm attracted to. But I'm not trying to sexually engage or progress this any more than just holding her and breathing with her. She takes my hand and moves it up towards her breast. She massages her breast with my hands. She slides my hand down between her legs. Lifts the waistband of her leggings to slide my hand down beneath. I pull back. I pull my hand back up and say, hey, slow down. It's okay. Slow down. She turns back to me, lying down on her side as we're in that spoon position. A gasp. A gasp to convey. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. This is so much better. As if a pressure valve was released on her spirit. As if the overtly sexual dimension of which she had constructed to protect against being vulnerable once more had been put to rest. Had said, you can go to bed now because the girl I want to see is the one behind the bars, the pure one, the one cloaked in a thin white dress Glowing, glowing like a full moon. By me in a raw sexual moment, which, albeit most masculine beings listening to this, would just go hammer and tong into, just go ham into, she starts sliding, your, she, she rubs her breast with your hands, she slides your hand down between her legs. Yeah, hang on. Hang on. It's a different thing. It would be a completely different thing if, I wasn't sensing any form of her barring her own sensuality and the purity of that and wasn't masking with overt sexuality. Then I probably wouldn't, like you would adjust in the moment. I'm sorry, I probably wouldn't have taken my hand back. I would have let go into the full experience. But that is not the case. When I just know that her breathing's off, heart rate's off, her mind's off. Right, Something's going on here. I don't know the depth to why we haven't had that conversation yet. And this is the thing. This is the thing, my friends, is that this is the case with with lusting firebirds that are overtly sexual is that it will progress this fast. Too many examples I have of where you just literally stepped out on the first date, been in the botanic gardens, sitting down on the bench, and she's already rubbing the inside of your leg and wants to make out then and there. Too many examples of overt sexuality that can catch you off, that can catch you off. And because it definitely stimulates a biological wiring within the masculine frame of that, oh, this is definitely a pathway towards, and I'm just talking about this purely from the gene standpoint, to procreation. Now, how we societally interpret that, whether you want to attach, whether, even if you're not very wholesome, or if you're not very well developed, the worst of cases, oh, I can get validation here. Oh, I can be the man. I can have sex. Right? You know, Hopefully you would have progressed well beyond that by now if you listened to my content. But let's say that you're new and you haven't yet. And let's say that you're hearing this shit for the first time and you're going, okay, so what is the objective here, Adam? The objective is no objective. The objective is that I'm a man, you're a woman. Let's see who we are together. I'm a man, you're a woman. Let's see who we can be together. I'm a man, you're a woman. Let's feel each other together now. Feel not in the raw physicality of things, feel in the raw spirituality of things. You put these two, you put these things together. Then when I'm in that moment with that girl, a few years younger than me, pushing the sexual pace way too fast, you have the clarity, 
the clarity of that full moon to be able to see what's happening here and to not burn, not allow the fire to continue burning down her temple. Right, there's a fire roaring within someone that has now turned malevolent at that point. Right? The fire can be used both ways. The fire can cook your food. The fire can burn your house down. Fire is great. Fire is great. It is great. Great in its destructive powers. Great in its creative powers. We must ascertain as human beings the application, the timing, the synchronicity of which that fire should and would be used. Her gasp. Please do not please do not skip over that gasp. When I said that she looked back to me, she turns her chin to her left to look over her shoulder back at me. That little gasp paints a story of a thousand words about all the things she had been going through to lock off her sensuality in truth to mask and masquerade with a sexuality that was too fast. What do you think likely was happening in that woman's life before that? Every other guy that she had been with had accepted that overt pace of sexuality, had not wanted to understand why she would be doing that. So as we're there in the moment, she feels that it was almost a sub, sublingual, subcommunicated test you go, well, if I, what, what happens if I do push the masculine energy too fast? What happens if I do show him a too fast pace of sexuality and offer no level of sensuality to go along with that? Does he take it? Does he, or does, does he just act as if there's no issue with this at all? Oh, okay. That's most guys. So I guess that's most guys. So we just keep this going. But I wonder if one day someone would do something a little bit different. I wonder if one day I'd meet a man who would actually recognize the internal trauma that I'm going through as to why I'd be doing this. Money. She lets out that little gasp and say, let's just breathe. Just breathe with me. Place my hand on her heart. Place her hand over my hand on her heart. Do you feel that? I feel that. Teach her to breathe without teaching her to breathe. Take the deepest diaphragmic breath you possibly can. Exhale as slowly as you can. In your one breath, that would transpire somewhere between six to eight seconds, combining your inhale and exhale she would likely take two to three breaths. Teach her to breathe without teaching her to breathe. Through a raw demonstration of this, she will slow her own breathing down. Learn to come in sync with you. A caressing of the back of her ear. To run your thumb along the back of her ear. Right, down into the little cup where the bottom of her skull would be. To go down along the jawline, down through her neck, crossing over her collarbone, her clavicle, running it straight down that thumb, straight down her chest, through the midline, past the heart center, down into her core, through to her navel. Each moment, attending to flickers, realizations of where pain may be stored. When you run physical touch through someone's center line, you will find embodied pain if there is any to be found. We install, we, we find, and this is where if you dive into my guided meditation and we talk about your center, other people refer to it as the core, the heart centers, whatever you may want to refer to it as, whatever description, we are all using the same words to point to the same thing, right? The center of your being. I say your center. As I said, the thumb runs down to your center. That's where we store everything. We store all our pain in our center. Taking a thumb and running it down from someone's ear, down their center line, down to their center. If they have physically embodied pain, it will manifest. You'll feel tightness. You'll see their breathing go off a rail. 
you see the heart rate go off the rail. You see different manifestations of tension within different muscles. A free person, a person that is free in that moment, would only become more relaxed as a result of you running your thumb down their center to be practiced carefully, to be practiced deeply. The reason why I wanted to tell you the story is to paint both sides of how sensuality can be locked off. Whether they show you no sexuality whatsoever, whether they show you all the sexuality, both can indicate signs of that someone had prisoned off their sensuality. And you just really need to sit into that. Sit into what that would really mean. Especially, and I think the contrast of someone who's very, very sexual, but with no sensuality, really what we're saying there is that they have no vulnerability. Right? Everything is do, do, do. Everything is do, do, do. Fast, fast, fast. Pump, pump, pump. Friction, friction. Rub, rub. Sex, sex. There's very little just be. Just be in the moment. Sit into each other. Allow him to feel all of who I am. That includes the pain. That includes those of which I believe to be negative self-perceptions, limiting beliefs, egoic attachments. Allow that all to bubble up to the surface. And maybe that manifests in me just ah, being a little erratic, being a little bit high strung. But as moment by moment goes by, as each flicker of the candle transcends into the night, maybe I could just relax. Feel a massaging of air energetic air between the two of us, a flow between the two of us, like waves within a pond. Ripples upon ripples informing the next ripple. All for at 1 to 2, 3 a.m. to come to the realization that he never needed anything from me. He never needed me to have sex with him. He never needed to penetrate me. He never needed me to receive him. He was just always going to be here in the purity of an idea that we both would like to understand each other a little bit better. And through that understanding, one may access the true sensuality of a human being without desire to fix, change, or rectify, but purely to understand, conceive of, and to relate to. So as, and as it is only really, the true intent of human practice together. To understand who we are. To realize that we are no one. So as to fully internalize that we are everyone. It's my hope that in this podcast, anyone that has been presented with a potential experience, you have a woman in your life, you have a man in your life, now that you could walk this path with. Take it slow. Take it slow. There may be many principles that I've discussed in this podcast that seem like either worlds apart from your concept of human experience or maybe just seem too difficult based on your human experience to even execute. Slow it down. The intent always to understand first. So this is me putting in a summary here. In order to unlock someone's sensuality, they first need to understand that you actually want to understand them. Install comfort and trust. How? Asking questions. State how you feel. Ask questions about that. Shut the hell up. Let them express. You do that over enough time. What you may find is an absolute cacophony, an absolute treasure chest of experiences, psychological, physical, sexual abuse that had gone on throughout their life. As you get to know who they are, start to understand how their sensuality is locked off, whether it's ice or whether it's fire. The final question which I said I would address was, when's it too much? When is it a foregone conclusion that this is never going to progress into something free-willing between both of us in terms of our sensuality? I don't think you could ever apply a true generalization to this. I don't think there's a true 
one size fits all approach to this. I think the principle of understanding who they are is the answer to that question. Because what I'm trying to say there, there have been some women in which that I've been over, it took maybe 10 weeks, 10 weeks, you know, over a couple of months for them to truly access their true sensuality. You know, it just took nine, one on a Friday night or a Saturday night, you know, eight, 10 times across a couple of months before they truly let go into a full body orgasmic experience of their concept of self, which then led to a full body orgasmic experience experience of their body, right? That they could fully orgasm in their mind and then their body. I take 10 weeks for some people, depending on how, how much they have installed, how, how, uh, how difficult the lock is on that gate, how, how intensely hardened the guard is protecting that prisoner. But why? Why would I persist through 10 weeks to be able to access that? I think largely it's because of I'm a little bit of a different case to most people. But maybe that shouldn't be the case. I have an unexplainable desire to understand people. I have an unexplainable desire to want to know myself in relation to other people. I don't know what it is. So nothing entertains me more than to know how inadequate I am and how much more I could improve. That's entertaining to me. What's fulfilling to me is to see how that benefits others. What fulfills me more than anything else is to know that someone else feels connected, feels confident and trusted within me. It's so fulfilling. And yet at the same time, I don't base my value in life on that. Like when a woman tells me, it's like, I just feel so comfortable with you, Adam. I can tell you about my life. I can tell you about things I don't tell anyone else. You're an absolute stranger and I've told you two hours of things that most people don't know about me. That doesn't give me an ego boost. It just gives me a deep, deep fulfillment. Fulfillment that just feels like peace. It's like you, you help someone, you be meaningful to someone. It makes you feel good in whatever way that you can. I think it's just hitting that reward system as a human being. You help someone else, you feel good. So what I said is that maybe I'm a bit of a different case, but maybe that shouldn't be the case. Why is that what I just said so unfamiliar? Why is that so not the predominant mainstream view and concept within masculine beings towards feminine beings to just want to understand? And and hopefully that that would change as a result of those of you listening. Hopefully those of you listening would see that and see the value and how much better you could be by trying to understand someone else better. It's been, uh, it's been quite a beautiful session. Getting a little bit of tingles thinking about it, getting goosebumps. <sighs> yeah, so I started this session because I wanted to help out a client just a little bit more depth. Yeah, we also had a session together, but we didn't spend as much time on it as, of course, I'm doing here. The way is there for you. The path is laid out. I'm always here for you if you need my help. And I truly wish that for all of you who are experiencing something as rare as humanity, that you would endeavor to illuminate the best of it for each and every one of us. Wishing you all the love, peace, and joy. Ja. That brings me to my thanks for all of you. Thank you, first off, for just being here, your presence. But please let me know. Let me know in a comment down below where you are in your lives, how you felt about this, any commentary. I'll do my best to get back as soon as I possibly can. And also, if you did enjoy the content, please hit the thumbs up on the YouTube video. It just helps it get sent out to more people in the community. And if you feel like this would resonate with someone else, please share it to some of your close friends. If you would like to dive into one-on-one -on -one coaching, that's all available on boldojo.com. Guided meditation, free resources of wisdom, free weekly on my newsletter, Bold Sip. Just chuck your email in, comes out every Friday. That's all available, all the links down below. And if you would like to support the podcast directly, you can donate anything that you wish through the PayPal link down below or on the website, boldojo.com in the podcast section. Anything that you guys give is always super appreciated. So I thank you very much. Wishing you all the love, peace, and joy in this life. Ciao.